Good afternoon, Congressional Climate Campers. Welcome to the second installment of VESI's Congressional Climate Camp. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policy to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Whether briefings or fact sheets, everything we do is freely available and accessible online. And as always, the best way to stay up to date and never miss a thing is to visit us our website at www.esi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. The first time we gathered for a congressional climate camp, which was, on the which was on the afternoon of the last Friday, January, so a month ago, uh, we focused on process and specifically the opportunities in appropriations, budget and stimulus to advance climate solutions. If you missed that session, visit www.eesi.org to watch the entire video or just the segments that you wanna learn about or read the written summaries. Today, we will take a step back and consider federal policies for high emitting sectors, and specifically these five sectors, agriculture, power generation, buildings, industry, and transportation. Each of these sectors deserves a dedicated explanation and discussion, and each needs to be put in the context of the entire economy. Climate change is an economy-wide challenge. The interrelationships between the sectors are complicated, but critically important to understand if we're to make any progress at all with the necessary urgency that climate change demands. And to help us understand all that, we have enlisted five top experts whom I'll introduce in just a few moments. My introduction today is a little shorter than normal because we have so much to cover, but let me just share two more bits of logistics. First, we still have more cl Congressional Climate Camp sessions in the works. Next month, we will dig into lessons learned from past Congresses and current public attitudes on climate change, and in April, we will study examples of federal policies for mitigation and adaptation win-wins. Each online briefing is structured to break out individual presentations to help busy staff target their learning. And everything, including slides and written summaries, will be posted online at www.esi.org. And a condensed audio-only version, audio version of each Congressional Climate Camp is available as an episode of our bi-weekly podcast, The Climate Conversation. And second, while we have a packed agenda, you can still send us questions that we will try to incorporate into the discussion as we go. If you have a question, you have two options to ask it. You can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online, or you can send an email to EESI at EESI.org. Just to set realistic expectations, we will not be able to get to every question. We have a very full agenda, but ask away anyway. We will do our best to follow up and answer every question submitted during today's Congressional Climate Camp. And now it is my privilege to introduce the first of our five experts. Christina Tonito is an ecosystem scientist in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University. Her research quantifies the environmental outcomes of agricultural, forest, and watershed management decisions. Her work combines literature review with statistical simulation model development to quantitatively compare land management decisions. Key themes in her research approach include quantifying the greenhouse gas impacts of land use decisions, quantifying the water quality impact of land use decisions, comparing conventional agricultural practices to ecological management scenarios that are economically viable, quantitative assessment of human impact on carbon and nitrogen cycling, and ecological approaches to soil and nutrient management. Christina, welcome to our briefing today. Thank you in advance for your presentation and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on regenerative agriculture and greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, I'm gonna talk today about greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, um, compare conventional and regenerative practices um, look at the greenhouse gas mitigation potential of agricultural systems and um, have some discussion of policy considerations. So first, let's look at greenhouse gas emissions. 
Um, agriculture contributes about 10% of uh, US greenhouse gas emissions. Nitrous oxide is the largest uh, form of greenhouse gases released, and it's mostly from soils, uh, and it's mostly due to applying too much nitrogen fertilizer. And so this um, reducing nitrous oxide is a large way to um, reduce the impact of agricultural sector. Um, the other largest contribution comes from animal agriculture in the form of methane, um, in part due to the digestion of, of cattle, um, as well as manure management. Um, so let's look at different agricultural systems. Um, first, I'll start uh, in looking at historic Midwest ecosystems. Uh, so these are restored lands in Illinois. Um, so you see on the left a restored wetland. Um, so these wetlands have very saturated soils and as a result, uh, carbon does not decompose easily. So these systems would be fairly carbon rich. Um, the prairie on the right would also be a carbon rich uh, soil because these prairie species um, direct a lot of their growth to very dense um, root zones. Um, in contrast, uh, this is what most productive corn and soybean regions look like in the United States. So they have um, extensive periods of bare fallow. Uh, so this is what they would look like right now, uh, the, the image on the left. Um, so bare soil and also tilled soil. So a lot of disturbance um, happening every year. Um, and they're also extensively drained so that wetlands do not form. And as you can see these drainage ditches uh, directing water off of the field so that they're productive. Um, but this also results in a lot of pollution. So the excess nitrogen and phosphorus leaves these uh, systems and uh, produces uh, trouble. On the left, you can see a picture of Lake Erie experiencing eutrophication um, that leads to toxic algal blooms. Uh, and in recent years, uh, at the end of the summer and in early fall, uh, Toledo has not been able to use its drinking water uh, due to algal blooms. Um, we also have an annual um, dead zone uh, due to hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, so a zone without oxygen where fish can't survive, um, and that averages more than 5,000 square miles a year. Um, conventional practices also result in a lot of soil erosion. Uh, so on the left, you see that natural erosion is about 21 meters per million years, and the highest um, instances of erosion are in the steep mountain regions in the west. Um, in contrast, if you look at croplands, uh, the map on the right, um, you can see that in intensive areas in the Mississippi drainage, you can have a thousand to two thousand meters per million year loss of soil. So about uh, two orders of magnitude larger erosion losses on croplands. Um, so regenerative practices have really emerged in response to environmental degradation. And the main goal is to reduce bare soil cover. Um, so by increasing plant cover, you bring more productivity into the system. Um, this leaves more plant residue on, this, um, on the land and it increases soil organic matter and therefore organic carbon. Um, it also maintains a longer active root zone, so nutrients get retained in the system, water can infiltrate into the soil and groundwater, it reduces soil erosion, and it improves the soil physical structure. Um, to improve the cover of soils, we use diversified rotations. So one example are the images on the right, so using cover crops instead of winter bare fallows. Um, so this can retain nutrients. If we're using a legume cover crop, it brings nitrogen into the system using solar energy. So the photosynthesis is providing uh, nitro the energy for nitrogen. Um, we can also use perennial rotations, which have these deep and dense root zones. Um, there's also use of no-till, uh, such as this image. So you see a farmer on the left planting seed into a field that has a lot of plant material on it. So they, they're directly drilling uh, seeds into the ground instead of using highly tilled fields. Um, on the right, you can see the benefit of no-till. So in this image, uh, the no-till or zero-till part of the image shows that following a heavy rain, water could infiltrate into the soil. So that water is used for subsequent growth or it's used to replenish the groundwater supply. Um, whereas on the right, uh, the conventional portion of the field, the water is just ponding on top. There'll be a lot of runoff and erosion of soil um, along with that runoff. 
Um, and these are examples of perennial systems that you could find in the United States. So uh, perennial grasses that can be used for livestock forage on the left. Um, and then on the right, there's an example of perennial wheat. So the really, really long roots are perennial varieties that have been developed by the Land Institute. And in contrast to this uh, much smaller root zone of an annual wheat plant. Um, and so these, these um, perennial varieties are not um, economically competitive yet with annual varieties, um, but they're in increasingly becoming economically viable. So increased breeding might enable these to be more common in the landscape. There are definitely trials in different parts of the US right now. Um, so what about the potential for greenhouse gas mitigation and agricultural systems? Um, so, uh, our group developed the fast greenhouse gas accounting tool that looks at commodity crops of corn, soybean, and wheat, uh, management practices of cover crops, reduced till, no till, nitrogen management. Uh, we look at a hundred year time scale and we're accounting for nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, soil organic accumulation, um, organic carbon accumulation, as well as leakage and permanence. Uh, this is an example of results using fast greenhouse gas for corn um, across the United States. Um, so the tool would uh, selects uh, legume cover crop as the best management practice in moist eastern U.S. regions and no-till on the dry uh, uh, parts of the U.S. And overall, if we if we implemented the best management practice over all harvested uh, lands we could expect about 8.3 million metric tons of CO2 emissions avoided. So to put that in perspective, um, if we implemented these best management practices over all corn, soybean, and wheat lands, uh, this would be about a 5 to 10% reduction of agricultural emissions, um, but that would only be you know, less than 1% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and these benefits would result from uh, both the regenerative ag as well as nitrogen management improvements uh, if we wanted to get up to closer to 10% reduction. Um, so some policy considerations. Um, the main benefit of improved agricultural management practices is to improve the soil resource and improve water quality. Um, this is achieved through increasing soil organic carbon, retaining nutrients, reducing soil erosion, improving soil structure and water management. Um, greenhouse gas mitigation is a co-benefit that is both um, produced in, um, as non-reversible benefits, um, which the biggest example is if we reduce an excess nitrogen application, we'll get a reduction in nitrous oxide emissions. We'll also get a reduction in carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions because we will be producing less nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and, and once that is accrued, you know, that benefit is real. It doesn't disappear. You've, you've accomplished that in the given year it's accomplished. Um, in contrast, we have reversible benefits of soil organic carbon accumulation. And so to think about that more thoroughly, um, because um, soil carbon is reversible, we have to deal with issues of permanence. Um, if, we have, if we have an improved management practice over 20 to 30 years, uh, most of that uh, carbon accumulation is occurring in those first decades. Um, but in order to retain that carbon in the soil, we have to maintain that practice indefinitely, essentially. Um, and so we need to understand what the cost is of a long-term commitment to an improved practice. Um, and not just the cost, but whether it's uh, realistic. So we need to understand what the risk of reversal in practice is. Uh, so that's really important um, in a policy setting. Uh, and so in general, if we're talking about reversible benefits like carbon accumulation, um, these are going to be riskier to account for than the non-reversible benefit of nitrous oxide, reducing nitrous oxide emissions or um, avoiding carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and so it's important to use these longer timescales, such as the 100 years that's common in IPCC reporting, um, if we're thinking, especially when we're thinking about these reversible processes. Um, another key um, feature in agricultural systems is thinking about leakage issues. Um, so if there's um, a change in yield, we have to account for the greenhouse gas consequences of the yield change. Um, and in 
you know, in greenhouse gas um, emissions accounting, the yield change actually is really significant. Uh, so we need to understand if a management practice uh, reliably changes the yield outcome. If there's a yield reduction, is it met through extensification, which is bringing more land into production or intensification? You know, can we increase productivity on existing lands? Uh, we need to be able to associate a carbon cost for converting natural lands into agricultural production or in the case of a yield benefit, we want to be able to, to credit the carbon benefit of removing land from production. Um, if we have as a goal to increase carbon storage in the landscape, um, this might happen uh, through a reduced demand for current commodity crops in the future. Uh, so there could be a future where there are more perennial systems, um, improved perennial forages and managed grazing. Um, the perennial grains we looked at earlier um, through, and through increased breeding could be, become more economically viable. And we might have a future where um, second generation biofuels and bioenergy um, create a, a bigger portion of the bioenergy um, distribution than now. Um, there might also be dietary changes where animal production uh, is less important in the food supply chain. So animal production uses about 80% of agricultural land right now in terms of providing food for animal uh, stocks. So um, this recent discussion about whether manufactured proteins will be disruptive and become really important in the food supply chains could uh, dramatically alter um, animal uh, numbers in the United States. We can also have a future where um, people are willing to pay for other ecosystem services, um, especially improved water quality, flood mitigation, and wildlife habitat or recreation. Um, and then uh, to think about how is improved management motivated, we often look at an ecosystem services framework. Um, so most commonly, uh, we use a payment for practice framework. Uh, in which the benefit of a practice is uh, generally estimated using a few long-term studies. Um, and then where we apply this average benefit and assume that if we aggregate over many farms, we we're getting that average benefit. Um, and this is feasible to implement at scale and is used for things like uh, encouraging cover crops to improve water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but we also, uh, there's a great need uh, for thinking about payment for outcome approaches, especially in things like carbon markets where uh, we want to be able to verify that a benefit has happened. And one of the main challenges to this approach is that on farm monitoring is very costly. And so um, often it can cost more than the payment that's available for the ecosystem service. So um, you know, this dilemma exists as to which approach is more realistic uh, modeling can certainly bring down the monitoring costs to some extent, but we still you know, require trained experts and all models re require uh, some amount of uh, on-farm data to be uh, robustly applied and, and, and data to also verify that the model itself is representative of the system. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions, we need to focus on reducing fossil fuel use across all sectors discussed today. Um, regenerative practices um, have a main benefit of improving the soil resource and improving water quality with greenhouse gas mitigation as a co-benefit. Um, if we're assessing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, uh, we have to account for leakage and permanence issues. Um, nitrous oxide and methane are the main uh, greenhouse gases emitted in the agricultural sector. Um, and uh, it's less risky if we focus on the uh, permanent benefits uh, from practice such as nitrous oxide emissions. Um, if we are gonna transition to carbon rich landscapes, farmers will need support to improve their practice. Um, this might occur if we have a, sh a dramatic shift in crop demand. Um, and we'll need to have um, support for accounting for ecosystem benefits in either a regulatory or market approach. Uh, so thank you for your attention. That's great. Thank you, Christina. Um, I have a, a premonition that I will um, use that summary slide of your presentation for a lot of my <laughs> work at ESI. That's a great sort of distillation of all of your points. Thank you so much for that. Um,
and, uh, and thanks for your presentation. Um, one of the challenges of this session we were talking about a little bit earlier today is, you know, there are sort of limitations of time and space. And um, the way we've organized today's sections where we're kind of going sector by sector makes sense for staff people who want to do a deep dive and learn about sort of agriculture and emissions reductions. Um, but one of our challenges is making sure that our audience has a clear set of takeaways about how each individual sector sort of contributes to the whole, but also relates to the other sectors. And so on one of your slides, you talked about, um, you know, um, a few different, um, the idea of net greenhouse gas emissions reductions, right? So there's some changes that we could be doing with respect to foraging and grazing. Perhaps there's some um, um, different outcomes with respect to bioenergy, biofuels, um, you know, sort of less meat oriented landscapes. But do you have any, can you help sort of explain to staff people who might be new to climate policy, sort of how they should think about agriculture, the agriculture sector in the context of overall economy-wide emissions reductions? Like what are the limitations of maybe putting too much sort of on the agriculture sector in terms of what it can deliver? Um, or are there, is there an issue of scale between some of the sectors that we'll talk about a little bit later, like power generation, maybe or transportation? Could you help just put the magnitude of emissions reductions possibility sort of in context? Um, well, so uh, our overall conclusions, um, including an analysis of risk of reversal um, or including estimates of risk of reversal, I shouldn't say that, our, that there's not that much data on how do you mm -hmm. estimate whether someone will be able to maintain a practice in 50 years. Um, so because we include the risk of reversal, you know, our conclusion is that if you have today's composition of crops, uh, so a commitment to a landscape dominated by corn and soybean crops, um, that you know, there's not that much potential for accruing, uh, for guaranteeing long-term carbon storage. Um, I guess the flip side to that is that um, you know, we don't actually directly consume most of the corn that's produced in this country. Um, so, you know, cereal production, so actually humans eating corn is less than 2% of the corn produced. Um, and all food supply is less than 10%. So 50% of the corn goes to feed animals and a 30% goes into biofuel and the, the byproduct of that goes to feed animals. Um, and so, you know, if there is a disruption of protein production, you know, and I, you know, if you believe some of this new literature coming out saying that we can substitute a lot of dairy and meat for these alternative, you know, lab derived meats, um, then you know, there could be different plants grown in the landscape and people wouldn't necessarily drastically change their diets to accomplish that, you know, there would still be high end meat production, but um, there would be different proteins um, elsewhere. Um, and you know, you, if, you, if you didn't, um, if we didn't need liquid biofuel, you know, if we could, if we were, everything was electrified, uh, then instead of creating, you know, instead of the energy inefficiencies of creating a liquid fuel from corn, um, if you actually burned biomass directly to support electrification, you know, you, you, would, you would be able to use different crops, for instance, um, and you could also, you know, there's more efficiency, you don't have to burn the water, essentially, out of, <laughs> out of the ethanol, you know, out of the uh, what's created when you're producing ethanol. So it's mostly water. And so you have to get rid of that water before you can use it. Um, so there are ways to, for, uh, you know, the, the landscape to, to interact a bit with the other sectors, but it just requires a re-envisioning of what we want to do with our landscape. Um, That's really helpful. Um, and we think at ESI, we think about liquid biofuels a lot. Um, you know, as we as we think about the transition taking over, taking place over time, you know, electrifying some sectors like aviation, for instance, is a different set of challenges. Or, you know, um, heavy duty equipment, for instance, things uh, or, or long range, um, you know, truck travel and things. So, um, that's that's a really interesting point. I um, I really appreciate the idea of incorporating sort of the potential for reversal into our expectations, into, into our policy planning. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I would add if, you know, if you could envision sort of land 
um, that would be you know, set aside for committed uses in certain ways for decades and decades, then we could actually attribute higher soil carbon. But you know, in a landscape where a lot of people rent their land, um, it's not clear to me that we can assume that any practice that's um, implemented in the next 10 years will be there in 50 years or 100 years. But that, you know, that can change. We can have policies that change that. And there could be incentives for people to switch to alternative practices if they're supported instead of them having to absorb the financial cost of and the risk of that. Uh, you're muted. It has to happen once per <laughs> Zoom, right? If, if not, people will be like, wow, he's too good at this. Um, I'm actually going to use a different mic because apparently I sounded a little bit too much like a robot and I'm not. Um, so, but Christina, um, what I was saying while I was on mute was just to say thank you so much for joining us today and for helping our audience understand agriculture sector emissions. Um, excellent presentation. And as a reminder, uh, to our audience, if you missed Christina's presentation or if you would like to see her slides, uh, be sure to visit us online, www.esi.org, um, where everything will be posted, in addition to written summaries over the next couple of days. So thank you, Christina. Um, and we really appreciate your joining us today. Um, one last uh, sort of reminder before we move on to our second speaker. Um, if you have questions, um, we are keeping track of them. And so we may not be able to get to all of them today, um, in between the Q&A that we have is going to be largely focused to sort of helping to tie the sectors together, to, to weave the sectors to, so people can understand how they fit together. Um, but if you have questions, please ask them and we will do our best to answer them, even if it's after the fact uh, today. Um, that brings us to our second sector and our second speaker. Uh, speaker. And it is my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Deepak Devan. He is Professor and Director of the Center for Distributed Energy at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He has over 40 years of academic and industrial experience in the areas of power electronics, power systems, smart grids, and distributed control of power systems. He works closely with utilities and industry and is actively involved in research, teaching, entrepreneurship, and starting new ventures. Um, Deepak is an elected member of the US National Academy of Engineering, member of the National Academy's Board on en en Energy and Environmental Systems, and part of its Committee on the Future of electric power in the United States. And yesterday, I think just yesterday, had a big report released. So it means a lot for us, uh, to us, to have you take time out of your busy, busy schedule, especially on the day after of a big report release to join us. So welcome to our briefing. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Great, thank you, Dan. And I, I'm hoping you can hear me. Let me try and see if technology works and I can share my screen. Um, and hopefully that works. Uh, everything looks good. Thanks. All right. Wonderful. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here for the uh, the briefing uh, for EESI. And thanks, Dan, for the uh, uh, the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, which one is it? Sorry, I think this is the wrong. Hang on. Sorry. My bad. I have too many things open out here. Oh, God. Where did it go now? Sorry. This one. OK. Is that visible to you? Not yet. Not yet. How about this? Not yet? OK, sorry about that. Give me one sec. I thought I had it all resolved, but obviously not. Oh, man. It doesn't look to me, Deepak, like you're sharing your screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm not right now. So I'm just trying to get this screen to come up. OK. You could also, if you would like, we have the slides on standby. If you would like to. Yeah, why, why don't we do that? OK. This is not, it's, it's giving me the wrong slide deck. We'll pull them up, and you can just uh, help us navigate the slides as we go. Yeah, we'll do. No problem. It's good when we have a backup. Is that working? There we go. Yep. 
Yes, this one. That's good. All right. Sorry about that. We we did we did the trial run and it seemed to work fine at that time. So you know, obviously, uh, there had to be a bug somewhere. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to be here to uh, to talk to everybody about uh, uh, the the impact of uh, the power generation sector on uh, on emissions. Uh, you know, I you know, next slide, please. As Dan mentioned, uh, I lead the Center for Distributed Energy at Georgia Tech. And uh, we are working uh, essentially on developing holistic solutions. Uh, uh, Dan mentioned that also interested in entrepreneurship. We've uh, kind of worked on taking some of these technologies actually to uh, to market. Uh, and uh, uh, we continue to work on uh, what we think is really an exciting time here where, uh, you know, new technologies like solar and uh, electric vehicles and wind and batteries are all starting to become, uh, you know, kind of really, really very, uh, very important. Uh, so next slide, please. So, so before we get into the uh, slides, are coming out slightly differently formatted, but that's all right. I think we can manage. Um, so, I think uh, before we get into the uh, the realm of how we can re uh, reduce uh, grid emissions, uh, let's think for a second uh, about uh, you know uh, how we have been able to kind of. Uh, um, you know, forecast the way that uh, the energy sector has actually been moving. Um, on the right, you start seeing a, uh, you see a chart uh, which shows uh, in black how solar technologies have been deployed uh, uh, in, in the world. And, and threaded out from that, you actually see the, the forecasts that have been made uh, by uh, the IEA in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how much solar would actually be used. So, so something is obviously amiss out here because, you know, we are not able to forecast exactly how the growth is going to occur. And in a sector that has so much of investment going on, that's, that's, a, real, that's a real problem. Uh, over the last hundred years, we've done very well with it, actually, because uh, we've uh, taken the grid and made it, uh, you know, completely a normal part of our life and everything we know really runs on electricity and without electricity things would kind of go down. So why is it that it's so difficult to uh, to make forecasts uh, about the future in, uh, in particular? Um, you know, one example of that is shown below. If you look at that chart, uh, uh, you know, where it says cumulative PV module sales, you, we, we see what we call a learning curve, where we see that for every doubling of volume uh, for the last 50 years almost, uh, the cost of solar cells has been uh, uh, going down by about 22%. Uh, and that's an exponential growth. So we are starting to see that, uh, uh, you know, all these technologies in some sense based on Moore's law, uh, you know, are showing exponential characteristics where, uh, you know, we are unable to predict really how well that pricing is uh, going to go down. Uh, and it's going down so fast that we are really not able to accommodate that in our business practices. And it's not just one technology, there's a whole multitude of uh, exponential technologies that are at the, at, uh, at the bottom of this and what that what that has done is it has taken for instance you know a solar technology solar with four hours of energy storage we are starting to see at uh, below grid parity uh you know below the price of gas below the price of everything else uh, and when you start seeing that kind of uh you know an economic force uh, it becomes very uh, kind of very difficult to predict how things are going to go. And these are all, all, all changes that are happening outside the utility sector. So that's the other part of it that is really problematic. So what is the opportunity that we have out here? Well, you know, we have the chance to uh, take a very big part of emissions, okay, which in this case of uh, electricity generation today is 26.9%, you know, but we also have transportation, which is 55% and then buildings and industry. So there's a, a chance that if we can uh, decarbonize generation, we can have a really big impact on uh, pretty much uh, everything. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, what are the opportunities for zero carbon generation? Okay, there's hydro is already there. Uh, there's nuclear energy, uh, ex existing nuclear fleet. Uh, we have wind and solar that have made a tremendous uh, progress over the last, uh, you know, 30 uh, years or so. Uh, and there are many few, uh, future technologies, too, that are coming out, which include, uh, you know, hydrogen and then, uh, you know, some of the clean fuels that, uh, you know, are zero carbon uh, in terms of impact. And then some small modular reactors that are coming out that, uh, you know, the next 10 years or so that could, could have a significant uh, uh, impact. So if you look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole area of is there enough of this uh, resource available? Uh, the answer is, I think there is, uh, you know, even if you you know, have a, a hundred mile by hundred mile PV plant located in the middle of Arizona, 
you would have enough energy generated to meet all of US annual uh, needs. So the problem is not that. The problem is how do you, you know, uh, couple that energy that is generated uh, to all the points of use? Um, you know, you've heard that uh, electricity really uh, has to be consumed at the same time it's generated. Uh, and uh, that has to be done not just, uh, you know, uh, at, a, at a certain place, but at every place at every time. Okay, so you had to balance everything, you know, from milliseconds to seasons, uh, and that creates a whole bunch of problems. Uh, it's also, you know, we had to think about the fact that as you're planning the grid and operating it, uh, we, we talk of uh, something called dispatchability, where you can actually at will, whenever you want to have the generation, uh, you know, startup, that's a problem. The second thing is you might have heard of the California duck curve, where we're seeing 13,000 megawatts an hour of ramp rate, uh, which has to be supplied. And there are not so many resources, especially solar and all, but, you know, the solar happens when it happens. So, you know, how do you do that? So that's, that's fast ramping is a big problem. Another one is what happens if a generator goes down? So we have to have something we call spinning reserve, which is kind of uh, sitting there idling away and waiting for that uh, occasional uh, moment when it's uh, supposed to uh, uh, be, be available for you. So what are the enablers for this type of technology? There's a lot of technology underlying all of this. Uh, this includes, uh, you know, long and uh, medium duration of uh, energy storage. We just talked about that. Uh, includes transmission. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, DC for very long distance. Otherwise, it's AC transmission. Uh, we also include some new technologies like power electronics that really uh, allow you to get that control of the electron uh, in the system and be able to deliver it where you want it in the shape and form and everything else that you want the energy uh, to be available uh, to you. Uh, there's also a communications technologies, internet technologies, cybersecurity. These are all kind of underlaying that. And then as you go to millions of devices, how do you manage the system? So there's a whole layer of automation uh, that needs to happen. Uh, you've just seen what happens in, in Texas. We've seen what happens in California. We need to have uh, generation available at the edge of the grid, not just at central. So there's microgrids that are required. And then there's, of course, carbon capture and sequestration is the other, uh, other approach. So we see a lot of new technologies that are kind of uh, uh, at the backbone of, uh, of this future grid that, uh, that we're talking about. Um, so what is the approach? The approach so far has been centralized generation. Uh, we have you know, large generating plants. We have large uh, control areas. Uh, and uh, the utilities of the last 100 years have really developed into a, a fantastic thing, except for occasional you know, Texas-like events. I mean, the, the lights are always on. We never think about it. We turn on the switch, the lights come on. That takes, that takes a lot of uh, uh, of work out there. But we are starting to see an approach where you can marry centralized generation and distributed generation in the form of, uh, you know, solar and uh, rooftop solar and uh, small generators and microgrids, uh, all sitting together, which can together meet the reliability goals that have always been there. Uh, but also resiliency. Resiliency is something you know that has started to become more important and in the era of climate change we're going to see more and more of these 100 uh, year events occurring every five years or so uh, and we need to be able to uh, to respond to that and of course it has to meet the, uh, the cost goals uh, as well. So the new uh, paradigm that uh, I think is you know possible will emerge and that's me uh, saying that is that we get the reliability and resiliency from the edge of the grid where there's a lot of new generation being sort of you know, kind of, uh, you know, located uh, for uh, for other purposes. Uh, and you get the affordability and sustainability from the bulk PV wind and everything else, because 90, 95%, 99% of the time, that's the mode you will be in. But that time when you are, you know, need to be resilient, you will have that uh, resource available. So we see a massive transformation occurring out here from a centralized passive and rigid grid uh, to a decentralized dynamic and resilient grid. So, so this is my educational slide. We, you know, kind of, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we see some, you know, you, you heard a lot about this, a lot of fast growing sectors, uh, you know, are transforming the way we uh, use energy. Uh, PV and wind farms are there growing at 120 to 160 gigawatts a year globally. Uh, as you add storage into it, this becomes a dispatchable and a more uh, usable resource. So that's wonderful. On the right, you see energy storage. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of modular uh, battery energy storage systems that are being deployed, Australia, here, everywhere, China, everywhere. So this is a massive growth area. Uh, we've always used pumped hydro where uh, you use two reservoirs and you can pump water up and down and, uh, and make that uh, work like a, a storage system. Uh, so that's all, always been there and we started to see some clean fuels emerge, uh, whether it's hydrogen or ammonia or, uh, or other clean fuel. Uh, we, uh, you've been seeing a lot about uh, transportation. I know there's a whole section on transportation later, that, so I, I won't talk too much about it except to say that it has to integrate with the grid. 
if you know we start to see DC fast charging as being the way to uh, to manage uh, cars and trucks, the fleet, and have the flexibility. Uh, but that also means that if I have uh, a few, uh, uh, you know, about ten percent of uh, the vehicles charging with fast fast charging, okay, I might need another thousand gigawatts of generation. So where the hell you're going to get that from? So this is another big uh, big issue. Uh, and then finally, I think resiliency comes from uh, uh, from the bottom up microgrids that we've been talking about. But that's cost again. So how do you manage all that? So this is really part of the overall challenge that we face. Next slide, please. So if you look at, uh, let, let's, let's kind of jump back into the reports and to what, uh, you know, uh, NASM is, uh, has really been working on. Uh, and I know that Texas is probably on people's minds, so we just kind of, uh, you know, kind of lead from that. Uh, there's the resilience report that was published in 2019 that came out of NAE, uh, where uh, they kind of looked at the whole idea of, uh, you know, how you would have, uh, you know, prepare against, uh, against uh, big events of, of this kind. And a process has been established, uh, but the recommendations that uh, came out with were that there should be a, a, a visioning process that, uh, you know, the state uh, agencies and the utilities kind of, uh, you know, go through uh, that kind of imagines what would happen when you have, you know, these large uh, plausible long duration outages that occur uh, and to kind of uh, really, you know, develop and demonstrate the technologies and operational arrangements that would allow us to mitigate the impact of uh, such events. So, so this has been kind of done uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we seem to rediscover this every time a big event occurs for this, this part of life. Next slide, please. Uh, another report that just came out a few months back was uh, really, I think, more aligned with what you guys are talking about here is, uh, is, uh, is decarbonization uh, and uh, kind of looking at what is uh, the pathway to getting to uh, near net zero uh, by around, uh, around 2050. Uh, and uh, looked at many uh, different things, won't spend uh, a lot of time on that, but uh, the need to establish energy standards uh, to kind of advance clean energy markets, uh, to make sure that we have zero emission vehicle standards uh, and for manufacturing as well. Uh, and uh, really, transmission infrastructure is really important to be able to connect all these areas of energy surplus to where energy is uh, is needed. Uh, and then, uh, when you compare across uh, different countries, we see that we are very uh, low in terms of the amount of federal funding that goes into into this area. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, the report that just came out uh, yesterday, uh, you know, is is really kind of focusing on the future of electric power. Uh, we see a major transformation that is occurring out here. The challenge is that because so many of these elements are happening outside the area of uh, uh, control of the utility industry, you know, we don't really see exactly how this is going to manifest itself. All the new technologies are coming and they're coming at breakneck pace and they're coming in a sector that is not used to change at a very fast pace. So that, that is something that is still kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, being, being understood. Uh, and uh, this change is gonna be different in different parts of the country. But we see everything from smart grids to uh, electric vehicles, to high voltage DC transmission, to presumers, to uh, energy storage, all these things are kind of, uh, you know, in there. Next slide, please. All right, so, so what, you know, there's about, uh, there's a lot of 50 yard recommendations. I'm just going to take two of those that come out of uh, the technology sector. Uh, one is, uh, you know, kind of uh, that there's a need to develop generation technologies uh, with zero uh, CO2 emissions, uh, which have high dispatchability, fast ramping rate. Uh, and then we have to have storage systems with multi-hour, multi-day and seasonal time shifting. Uh, and then you have to have power electronics that allows real-time control of the grid. So this is, uh, you know, overall, the second uh, recommendation uh, is really uh, that uh, there's a new paradigm that seems to be emerging, which is moving away from very large centralized facilities uh, to more modular distributed edge intelligent uh, systems, uh, which in, in, you know, have the possibility of changing the grid paradigm completely uh, because you can get better sustainability, better reliability, better resilience, and better affordability uh, all at the same time. A lot of other things that are talked about in the report, I'm not going to take a lot of time on it, but it's important to see that you need uh, to do, uh, you know, uh, transition of power generation to low carbon uh, and also to kind of uh, uh, make sure that we use uh, this decarbonized electricity uh, for transportation building industry and other uh, areas. As you move to this new uh, technology, we find also that uh, grid stability uh, becomes a problem, has to be addressed. Uh, we see that there's a significant amount of uh, innovation uh, that is required to integrate all these things uh, together. Uh, and as we said, we need more, uh, more investment. Next slide, please. 
so this is again a summary. I think I would uh, encourage you to kind of uh, go and uh, check on the NASM website. Uh, this is all available. Uh, we see again a need to develop generation storage uh, technologies. We need to see government industry collaborate in this and de-risk the new technologies. Uh, and uh, we also uh, uh, need to have all the other layers of technologies in terms of ICT, in terms of uh, flexibility, automation. Uh, all of these things have to be uh, put in place. Last slide, please. So I think. In conclusion, what I want to say is, uh, you know, there is uh, an, a pathway to achieving low uh, emissions. In the past, it's been seen as a trade-off, where we always say that low emissions comes with higher costs and poor reliability. Okay, uh, I think that has changed now. We see that there's been an unprecedented change in the last uh, 20 years, uh, and we're starting to see that the cost of these exponential technologies, which are at the heart of how this can actually happen, uh, have come down and, are, and keep going down at a you know at a rate that is absolutely unbelievable, but you know very very predictable. I mean, uh, you know, and so so this is going to have some major disruption uh, in terms of overall things that we need to kind of uh, be flexible, prepared, and adaptive in terms of how this can do. But this is an opportunity to transform the system to a low carbon system that's also reliable, resilient, and affordable. It needs fundamental rethinking, needs innovation, needs new policies, needs new investments. All the change has been done really when there's an alignment of forward-leaning uh, policies and uh, incentives that aligns with what technology can do. And when that happens, you get this explosive growth in solar and batteries and EVs, everything that's happening is really driven from that. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And my apologies for the uh, snafu in the beginning, but uh, you know, happy to answer questions. Oh, thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. And then, uh, you know, snafus are what, you know, make online briefings fun, right? If it wasn't for that. Um, thanks for that. Um, just uh, so you know, um, we'll post your slides and we have a PDF version. So um, the version, um, to the extent that there was any formatting, you know, different versions of, of PowerPoint, let's say, we'll, we'll make sure to post that because those are very dense slides and there's lots of great information in there. And we'll also, with your permission, include links um, yeah. to those reports as well, especially yeah. the one that just came out yesterday. Um, I, I liked your slide about, you know, sort of the grid is changing, right? The future of electricity generation or the electric power sector in the United States, it's becoming more distributed, it's becoming smarter, it's becoming sort of quote unquote grid edge in a lot of ways. As that continues to happen, as that evolution continues to take place, what does that mean for how um, generation, generation sector emissions will be impacted by or will affect the emissions from some of the other sectors we're gonna talk about today, like transportation and buildings in particular? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very big question, correct? I mean, uh, and again, I, you know, I mentioned that uh, these sectors are not controlled by the utility industry, which has generally been a very regulated industry, very plodding, very slow moving, uh, and uh, you know, and and the electric vehicles industry, in particular, transportation, is moving at breakneck speed right now. Uh, and there's an assumption almost that there's always going to be a plug somewhere you can plug into the grid and it's going to charge you. And uh, that's not so easy to think of, because you know uh, what's coming out is that uh, both from an equity point of view as well as from a technology point of view and a social point of view, people really are going to be looking more and more at fast charging, uh, which means that uh, my car is now going to be charging at 150 kilowatts, and my truck's going to charge at one to one and a half megawatts. If I have 50 trucks uh, charging at a station. Okay, that's 75 megawatts. That's a substation. Okay, you can't do that in a few years. Uh, and that's the pace at which people are moving. So how, how do you reconcile that? Because as you said, I mean, you know, the last thing you want to do is burn, have coal burning so that you can drive around an electric vehicle, right? So there's a lot of grid integration that is required, which means there's going to be generation at the edge that is required. And that's happening anyway, because we are seeing, you know, more and more data centers. We're seeing more and more uh, kind of grid service providers, microgrids, all of these are going in. So there's an opportunity for the resource to be available at low cost but it's not been traditional. The regulators have not normally allowed microgrids to operate except in, uh, inside your own campus. 
Okay, so uh, so there's, there's there's some policy issues out here that uh, you know need to be uh, addressed at the same time. But once it can be done, I think the opportunity is is really incredible because you know I, I think of the grid as an ecosystem. I don't think of the grid as a service. You know the loads have a part to play. The generation has a part to play. Management has a part to play. All of these things have to work together uh, to to deliver the service. So that's that's my view. Buildings have a great. Uh, opportunity here to become microgrids of their own, so they become contributing, uh, to, you know, to this to the overall grid operation paradigm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, transportation is a very big piece of the puzzle as well. Great. Well, that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. And um, to our audience again, um, if you would like to go back and revisit any of Deepak's presentation, everything will be archived online. Um, and uh, and really encourage everyone to go visit that um, that uh, to access that report. It's, it's great and it represents some really excellent thinking on your part and your team. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Great, well, you provided a wonderful segue to our next two speakers, uh, who uh, the first of which will speak about buildings and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, industry and then we'll talk a little bit about transportation. But first buildings, um, which I won't say it's my favorite of the sectors, but I have a bit of a soft <laughs> spot for buildings. And it's a pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Elizabeth Beardsley, uh, Liz brings more than 20 years of professional experience working on environmental and climate issues, both as an engineer and a lawyer. In her current role, Liz is Senior Policy Counsel at the U.S. Green Building Council, a global environmental nonprofit best known for LEED, the world's most widely used green building rating program. She provides strategic green building law and policy guidance and direction across the international, federal, state, and local spectrum. And her work focuses on connecting building policy to climate mitigation. Welcome to the briefing today, Liz. Um, I am uh, really looking forward to your presentation. And uh, just from a timekeeping note, um, pretend as though we're starting exactly at 2.45. So we'll, we'll just kick everything a couple minutes down the road. So don't, don't, don't skimp on us. Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. And that was my first question. So I will, uh, I do have a jam packed presentation. So um, great to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right. Um, how do I get this fixed here? Yeah. Full screen. Okay. Super. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, spending some of your Friday afternoon, and thanks again to EESI for hosting this event and inviting me. Um, USGBC has been around for over 25 years. We are a mission-based nonprofit organization and we're focused on transforming our buildings and communities to support uh, people that live and play and learn in them as well as the planet and to, um, to show what's possible and help drive market transformation. Um, we're best known for LEED, but we also have credentials, education, um, lots of resources for for people, we do advocacy. Um, so we have a full range of platforms that we leverage towards this mission. So my presentation this afternoon will focus on two parts. First, uh, some facts to sort of set the stage for the role of buildings in the overall US greenhouse gas emission picture. And then secondly, getting into some of the policy approaches that are being discussed and proposed. And there, there are many, so I'll give a, a smattering of that. So I'm going to start with the takeaways because we'll quickly get into some graphs and things. So I just want to make sure that uh, to emphasize these. So first of all, buildings are significant uh, as, as part of the overall picture of U.S. emissions. Um, the, I was interested to see in the invitation for the event today, 12% was called out as buildings contribution. And that's actually the direct combustion piece of how buildings contribute. So um, when you're burning, if you have fuel oil or um, a gas connection at your building, that's what's being counted in that 12%. But if you include the emissions associated with your electricity use, that goes right up to 38% um, total. So clearly, if we are going to make a dent in our emissions, we have to address buildings. And I do want to, you know, the good segue um, from the from the prior presentation is absolutely. We, um, we need to have, sorry about that. Um, 
we need to integrate buildings as part of the grid more and more. So whether it's to make space for beneficial electrification of buildings or to allow for EVs, um, the, the base load that we're currently, that, that the amount of energy that buildings are using really has to come down. But the good news is it can. So we'll get to that towards the end. Um, the drivers of this contribution are the age of buildings, you know, whether they were built to a code or have had efficiency retrofits, and then sort of the overall size of the building portfolio in the country. And another key point is that buildings have a greenhouse gas impact beyond energy. Although energy is the, the clearest and, and the most obvious, we focus on that. But if you think about it, when waste is created, when you're building a building or replacing uh, equipment over its life, you're using water to serve the building, um, you're using materials to build the building, all of these things also have an impact, uh, which we'll get into. And, and with that, both the construction phase and the operations phase matters when you're looking at the life cycle impact of a building. So looking at buildings as an end use sector um, here, these two red arrow columns, this is data from the US Energy Information Administration. And you can just see that the blue part of the columns uh, for residential and commercial there those are that, that on-site combustion piece of it. And then the brown part is the electricity. So both matter. I mean, if you look at residential and commercial together and, and you stack those, that would be rivaling transportation. Um, I think as the grids get cleaner then, and as buildings get more efficient, that should come down. And uh, so the relationship between them might change. But just to kind of give you at a glance um, what we're talking about. And this um, spaghetti chart, I, I'm not going to force you to stare at this for too long, but I want you all to know it's available because, um, you know, work has been done to map out each of the different fuel types and how they're used by the end use sector. So, like, if you get a question, you know, from your boss on, well, how much coal is really used in buildings these days? Like, this is where you can find that information. So this is just letting you know this is available um, too, so. And then, you know, what in buildings is causing all this energy demand? This is gonna be a little different based on the climate zone, um, sort of the building uh, stock characteristics and things like that. This happens to be from New York City, um, who's done a lot of analysis but you can see that um, here in this, in this example that you know, space heating is sort of the single biggest uh, pulling natural gas and some oil. And then um, your plug loads, which is literally things that are plugged in. So all your computer type stuff and other equipment um, and lighting are, are quite a bit. And then space heating or space cooling, excuse me. Um, uh, hot water, ventilation, there's some other things there, but, you know, heating, cooling, plug loads, lighting, these are the kinds of things that might be in a little bit different order depending on, on where you're talking about. So there's the three scopes of greenhouse gases, um, and this is the UNFCCC's framework, where scope one is that on-site combustion. Um, Scope two is the greenhouse gases from electricity generation. And scope three are indirect emissions. And uh, this has been getting more and more attention because as the other, you know, as the grid gets cleaner, and especially if there is more beneficial electrification, moving the, reducing the on-site combustion, then the scope three will become more and more significant on a relative basis, right? So, Scope three is things like um, it's that water and wastewater. So if you're using a lot of water in a building that's being pumped, treated, pumped again, treated again, et cetera. Um, if you're not using durable materials and you have to do a lot of replacement over the life of the building, that's another area where all of those materials have with them and the cost of carbon, there's embodied carbon to transport them, to put them in a landfill or what have you, and then commuting and, and other factors. So the some analyses, it's going to be different again based on the grid characteristics make it make a big difference. But um, like this particular donut graph uh, that was done 
a few years back showed that the scope one was about um, a fifth, uh, scope two is almost a half, that's the power related emissions, and then scope three was about a third. So if you think of scope one and two as shrinking, that scope three will become more important again on a relative basis. And there's also a time component to consider. So if you think about the day one, like the first day of a new building, you've just uh, had all this construction equipment, you've probably had materials from concrete to wood to windows come in from all over the place, and that's transportation is, is a carbon cost, the manufacturing, um, mining, there's all kinds of things that go into making buildings and building products. So that's your day one cost. Um, sort of a conventional building over a hundred year life, you might have like this middle graph where you have um, all of that operational energy kind of adds up over time. So the initial, that initial construction phase uh, footprint is not that great. But as buildings are becoming more and more efficient, then that operational energy gets smaller and, uh, and your, um, that construction phase gets more important. So, um, so it's starting to get more attention from a policy perspective as well. And then globally, just you can see here that um, buildings are getting more efficient on a, a per square foot basis, which is good. That's this graph on the left that's coming down. It needs to come down more, and, but it's at least going in the right direction. However, it's really being offset by increases in floor area. Um, this is a projection of how, much, how many more square feet will be added in each region. So North America here, I mean, this is all that blue side is projected additional floor area that will be created. So if we want to, uh, we already have to make up a deficit, but in order to accommodate all that new building space, if that is even somewhat accurate, we've really got to reduce our energy consumption in, in all our buildings. And then buildings aren't getting any younger. Um, that's where retrofitting comes in, I guess, to give them a facelift. But uh, you know, as of 2012, about half of U.S. buildings had been built before 1980, and we know that um, you know it wasn't until around 1990 that we had better energy codes starting to be in place. Now they're much better. So those these this half of buildings are tending to have poor insulation envelopes that aren't as well sealed and inefficient systems. So that has a lot of implications for policy to get that total energies from the building sector down. So the good news is we can do better. We know how to do this. It's happening, but it's not happening at the scale quite that we need yet. And that's where policy will come in. Um, so for example, the New Buildings Institute tracks net zero energy buildings. Um, this graph in the middle shows the trajectory of, of how many they've counted, and you can just see how, how that's um, rising so much, which is great. Um, we have lots of case studies now. For example, the AGU headquarters near DuPont Circle, which is a, an old historic building, um, was renovated to net zero energy, and that's a retrofit. Um, and that's a great example. We have a case study on our website, and there's, there's lots of others. Um, and we also know with the existing buildings that we can get them to perform better. So a study in California, for example, showed looking at those other aspects beyond energy that uh, the certified buildings had 50% less greenhouse gases associated with water use, uh, almost 50% less associated with solid waste, and then 5% less from transportation. So those are also places to, you know, with that scope three additional uh, greenhouse gas footprint uh, can get better. So turning to policy, um, there's lots of ways to slice and dice this, and there are a lot of great ideas out there. So it's, it's a really exciting time. I want to highlight the administration's goal to retrofit 6 million buildings. I think that would be a really great start. Um, the way we tend to think about uh, one way to think about buildings is new construction. So every every new building like can and, and really should be highly efficient. It should use this latest technology. It should be comfortable um, and reduce 
energy intensity. Um, retrofits, that this can be like a harder piece of the puzzle, but as I said, like we definitely know how to do this, this can be done. Um, workforce is another category, um, especially with some of the newer technologies that are becoming more mainstream. We've got to make sure the installers and the builders out there know how to work with them and are actually incentivized and encouraging their use. Um, since they're often the interface with consumers. And then our D&D &D and technology, like this has been a huge piece of the transformation um, and needs to continue, especially on that like deployment demonstration side. So we can add like sort of think of those buckets and apply that to different sectors. So first of all, federal buildings is really an opportunity to lead by example. Uh, we would advocate for investing in cost-effective energy improvements um, that can also boost resilience and health, among other co-benefits. Um, appropriations and funding are, of course, like a primary way to do that, um, but uh, we also would want to establish buildings goals and buffer agencies and direction. Um, there's been a lot of great work done by key agencies, including GSA, um, defense, uh, Department of Energy. So we want to kind of push them to the next level and set goals such as for energy and water efficiency, greenhouse gas intensity reduction, um, net zero for new construction, deep retrofits, and incorporating charging for zero emission vehicles. And then there's also opportunity to leverage private sector finance. For example, the Open Back Better bill um, would use the Affect program to help fund resilience uh, paired with performance contracts to implement uh, deep efficiency projects. Those are some examples. On the commercial building side, including non-federal public buildings, again, appropriations and funding is a key aspect. Also using all the DOE programs to advance on all fronts, so that covers workforce, and rd and is a big piece of what they do. Um, deployment and demonstration, um, energy codes work is very important, the Better Buildings Program, so there's really a lot going on there that helps support commercial buildings across the country. Um, tax incentives, so the 179D tax deduction for commercial building, energy efficiency equipment, um, the Green Act is one example. There's also our proposal for EQIP, which would uh, allow accelerated depreciation for highly efficient equipment, and that's uh, another great idea that's getting attention. Um, again, leveraging private sector finance, in this case, the Open Back Better would be run through the state energy program um, to get out to public buildings and, and uh, critical facilities like um, schools, hospitals, and so on. Uh, there's a proposal for investing in public buildings, energy improvements uh, through the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grants Program, and then state energy programs program overall uh, ha has lots of pieces of this as well. Um, schools are, are near and dear to my heart. Um, we have a center for green schools and we've worked on schools policy uh, for a long time. Um, some of the key proposals here are to boost the U.S. Department of Education's ability to support healthy, green, low-carbon schools. Um, the, the big bill for schools right now is the Reopen and Rebuild America Schools Act, and that would include uh, significant funding, um, would help address equity in, or address inequity in school facilities across the country, and it includes minimum energy codes as well as green school provisions. Um, there's also a proposal for energy efficiency grants for schools. Um, there would be a piece of some of the open back better uh, could be used for schools. And then technical assistance is also uh, really helpful with Department of Energy and EPA having programs as well as states through the energy offices and departments of education. Um, residential, there's a lot of ideas here too. Um, Again, appropriations and funding. Um, one specific proposal is the Housing as Infrastructure Act, which was in HR2, the House Infrastructure Bill last year. And that would include a set aside for energy and water. And there might be, um, yeah, so there's, there's that idea. 
There's also um, all the DOE programs again, but applied to residential. Um, there's HUD, USDA, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs programs, basically anything where there's housing retrofits or reconstruction um, at, a at a certain scale that provides opportunity to increase energy efficiency and resilience. And um, the Energy Efficient Neighborhoods Act is one bill that, uh, that helps work with those programs. Um, weatherization assistance program has been well proven to be effective um, and that's a likely place for additional investment. Workforce training, um, one of the bills out there is Hope for Homes that helps provide uh, even like online training um, for the workforce with incentives. And then tax incentives, the Green Act has uh, some additional residential incentives for new homes as well as individual equipment. And then there's a rebate proposal as well with the Homes Act. Um, so there's specific technologies and approaches as well, certainly um, to reduce that direct combustion piece to go towards electrification where the grid can handle it and the grid is getting cleaner, like that can have an overall benefit to the total carbon impact. And that's certainly helped along by some of the technologies that have come out of DOE's investment um, in building technology. So it kind of all comes together uh, there. Um, so there's a lot of individual pieces. There's thermal storage, which is becoming a real thing. Um, battery storage, when combined with on-site renewable energy, that can really help with that grid integration piece. Um, and really, there's all these, uh, there's so much going on in the building space. We just need to get it out there. Um, I'm sorry I'm going so fast, but I'm trying to keep an eye on time. Um, and then, you know, just one, uh, one example I wanted to highlight with some of the research development and deployment is grid interactive efficient buildings. Um, you know, these are buildings that work with the grid, they're connected, they're integrated, and utilize a lot of these technologies in combination in, in a way to um, help reduce uh, impact on the grid and help support it by having a flexible demand and reduced peak. Um, and uh, there's been some work on this by New Buildings Institute with the grid optimal as a, an emerging standard. So that's something that is um, kind of pulling in a lot of these pieces and that Department of Energy is working on. So lastly, I'll just say buildings are infrastructure. Um, they're part of the system and there's really huge opportunities to improve resilient health and quality of life while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'm excited to see what will come in the next uh, few years. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. That was a fabulous presentation um, and uh, really appreciate that. I think one thing that really sets buildings apart from some of the other sectors we're going to talk today with the possible exception of transportation is just how intimately we know buildings, um, right? Um, mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time in buildings um, and your presentation did a great job of um, running through some of the opportunities to reduce emissions um, in a sector that we're all pretty intimately familiar with. Um, I always like to think that every building is an existing building. Uh, yeah. It's right, sort of by yeah. definition. So um, lots of great stuff. A lot of the points you hit on, Liz, will also be covered, although by different speakers at a briefing we have next Friday um, that uh, uh, is available. You can sign up for it on our website, www.esi.org. We'll be talking about a lot of those DOE programs. Um, so great. Thank you so much, Liz. It's um, a wonderful presentation. and. Thank you for helping um, our audience understand just how important buildings are in uh, in climate policy. And also, thank you for making the buildings or infrastructure point. Cannot say that enough. Okay. Um, Thanks, Dan. We, no, thank you. Um, we are going to, um, unlike the fact that most people interact with buildings pretty regularly, very few people interact with big industrial facilities uh, very regularly. Um, and to help us understand industrial emissions sector um or industrial sector greenhouse gas emissions it is my privilege to introduce our fourth speaker of the day dr julio friedman he is a senior research scholar at the center for global clean energy policy at columbia university where he leads a new initiative in carbon management recently he served as principal deputy assistant secretary for the office of fossil energy at the department of energy 
where he held responsibility for DOE's R&D program in advanced fossil energy systems, carbon capture and storage, CO2 utilization, and CO2 removal. He's held positions at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, including Senior Advisor for Energy Innovation and Chief Energy Technologist. Julio is an internationally recognized expert in carbon capture and storage, hydrogen energy systems, industrial decarbonization, and CO2 removal. Welcome to the briefing today, Julio. Sorry we're getting uh, started with your portion a little behind schedule, but we're all really eager uh, to hear what you have to say. And please don't let the fact that we're a couple minutes late um, impact too much how you proceed. We'd like to give you the, the full 15 minutes that we, uh, that we talked about when we were putting this together. So I'll turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and it's a delight to be here. Uh, uh, this is an incredibly important topic and a great audience, so I'm happy to have a little floor time. Uh, as Dan said, uh, most people don't go to the store and buy 10,000 tons of concrete. So you don't see this stuff every day. You don't have an intimate relationship with it. Uh, but in fact, this is the big how it's around. This is the big lever for, for decarbonization of the United States energy economy, and it's the hard one. So uh, let me just give you a couple of facts to orient you. Basically, industrial emissions are almost a quarter of global emissions, 22%. Just heat, just the heat from heavy industry is 10% of global emissions. And to give you a sense of scale, that is more than all the cars and all the planes together. Just industrial heat. And most people don't wake up in the morning thinking about industrial heat. That's why I, I do that service for you and happy to talk about all the ways in which we can manage the emissions from heavy industry. A uh, little bit of framing here. First of all, the core arithmetic of net zero is clarifying. Net zero means net zero anything. Uh, all of the embodied carbon that Liz was talking about in her buildings, it all comes from industrial production. You have to zero that out or else you're not doing your job. Uh, if you emit anywhere, you have to unemit an equal amount someplace else. Uh, and it's gonna require all sectors and all approaches. Um, industry is also a little different in that buildings are made and used locally. Electricity is made and used locally. Cars are run locally. Industry is trade exposed. It is making commodities that are used all over the world and compete on a global market. And the options that we have to decarbonize them are relatively small, unlike the power sector where we have lots of options for decarbonizing. In the industrial sector, we have only a couple of options. And all of the options are expensive compared to a lot of the other things we would do. So it's born hard. It's just the nature of the beast, but it is every bit as important as power. It is twice the size of transportation. It is three times or four times the size of buildings. It's just a big thing to do. And if we get this right in the United States, then actually we have an export technology that we can bring to other countries. We have a opportunity for trade, which is virtuous and good. Another thing about industry that most people don't clock is that like buildings, uh, the assets are long lived. So this is a picture of a typical pro chemical production facilities. Most of these last for 30 years at a minimum. That's a typical half-life and almost all of them are less than 10 years old. So they're going to be around for a long time. So they're going to keep emitting unless we do something. So we have to use the existing fleet if we want to get someplace. It's even worse with steel. You just, it's just hard to do. And this means they're going to be around for a long time. That means we have to work with the existing stock. So let's talk about US industrial emissions. Uh, again, uh, depending on the data you look at, 2018 industrial emissions were the number three sector. In 2019, they're number two. In 2020, the data I've seen suggests it might be number one because people didn't travel as much. <laughs> Transportation dropped, industry didn't, industry grew. And where it comes from, I would take, uh, pay attention basically to the brown and blue together. That's refining and chemicals. That's more than half of the US fleet. The next big one, cement. After that, steel. Those three are the same everywhere in the world. Cement. Iron and steel and chemicals are the three big emitters. Together, they're typically 60% of the mix worldwide. It's just a lot of stuff. And a lot of the processes that operate in these are constrained by their chemistry and they're constrained by their physical requirements. 
This is where they are, and this gives you a sense of what's around the United States. The green ones are ethanol facilities. The blue ones are hydrogen facilities associated typically with refining. We've got petrochemical facilities. We've got cement kilns all over the country. They're in lots of places. One of the nice things that you might not have thought about is that a lot of those facilities are actually reasonably close to good places to store CO2. So one of the options you have is CO2 capture and storage. I'll come back to that later, but that turns out to be a very important option for heavy industry. So let's talk about what these things are. What are the options? What can you do? So let's start with just the temperature that these things operate at. Cement plants operate typically at 1500 degrees Celsius, 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. Any industrial process that starts with melting a rock uses a lot of heat. <laughs> That's true for steel too. Steel's about 1200 degrees Celsius, about 2500 Fahrenheit. If you're melting a rock, you're using a lot of energy. And it, makes, it means that you can't electrify things easily because you just need so much energy to get the job done and you have to deposit the heat inside the system. It's just hard to do. So what are the options that we have for this stuff? Hydrogen's an important one. If you have zero carbon hydrogen, you can do a lot. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. This is actually hugely valuable in the industrial sector, more so than many of the other options. And, uh, and another option is carbon capture, which we talked about. You can use fossil fuels to make the heat. You can capture the byproduct emissions from cement and from steel, which are tied to their chemistry of formation. You can just capture that stuff and store it. It's the only way to zero out those emissions. You can throw in biomass, biogas, wood pellets, all these sorts of things. The temperatures are an issue sometimes, but it's something you can use. You have to make sure that biomass is actually lo you know, truly low carbon. If it's not low carbon, if your life cycle is poor, then you're going to end up in the wrong place. And some things you can electrify. Not a lot, but you can electrify a lot of things. In order to electrify something, it has to be zero carbon or you're wasting your time. In fact, if you use grid electricity in most of these processes, you increase the net carbon emissions. It's really got to come in at low carbon electricity. And you need high capacity factors. Most electrical facilities operate upwards of 85% of the time. Since they're constantly operating, you can't use intermittent loads. You have to use something that's reliable. An industrial contract is typically more expensive than a power purchase agreement. It's typically more expensive than a wholesale price. So the cost ends up being an important component of what goes into these things. Let's take a little bit, talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen's uh, the Swiss army knife of deep decarbonization. You can use it for all kinds of stuff. And in fact, there's a vibrant hydrogen market today. Worldwide, we make about 70 million tons of hydrogen. That emits about half a billion tons of CO2. In the US, we, emit about, we make about 10 million tons of hydrogen that emits on the order of 50 million tons of CO2, okay? But if we can get zero carbon hydrogen, we can actually get rid of that 50 million tons day one and start making stuff with zero carbon hydrogen. That'd be nice. It also is, burns hot. Hydrogen burns at 2100 Celsius. It is hot enough for any industrial process. If you really need a little bit hotter, you can burn hydrogen and oxygen, and it burns at 2,800 Celsius. That's hot enough to melt tungsten. That's, that's hot enough. Um, and of course, hydrogen can be used in other sectors too. You can use it as a transportation fuel. You can make synthetic fuels like ammonia out of it. You can throw it into turbines for the power sector. You can run it through fuel cells. You can use it as a feedstock for a circular carbon economy. There's all kinds of other reasons to go after hydrogen. It just has particular value in the industrial sector. In the US, we make it mostly gray hydrogen. 95% of the hydrogen in the world and 95% of the hydrogen in the US is gray hydrogen. Gray hydrogen is something like steam methane reforming, where you put fossil fuel in, you make hydrogen, the yeah, comes out, and the CO2 goes into the air and oceans. You can make something called blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen basically takes, is the same process, but you're capturing CO2 so it's not emitting. There's actually several facilities in the United States and in North America that do this today. For example, in Port Arthur, Texas, they capture about 60% of the CO2 to keep it out of the air. You, of course, can also make it by putting zero carbon electricity into water. If you do that, that's called green hydrogen, typically. And green hydrogen, as long as it has zero carbon electricity going into it, is truly very, very, very low footprint. It's near zero. And that makes heat 
that makes industrial feedstocks, that makes chemical reductants, it makes all these things that hydrogen is good for. The key cost here is challenge. And so the key challenge here is cost. Try it the other way around. The key challenge is cost. Uh, today, in the US, it costs on the order of a buck a kilogram to make hydrogen, a buck, a buck 20, depending on natural gas prices. If you capture the CO2, you're adding something between 30 to 80% to that cost, depending on how much of the CO2 you capture. So with a 80 or 90% capture of the CO2, you're basically up at two kilograms, give or take. Uh, if you're using uh, cheap green electricity, then you're basically much more expensive. Uh, most cases in the US, you're looking at somewhere between three and eight dollars a kilogram so much more expensive than what the market has today this is a clear-eyed call for market aligning policies you need the policies so that these things can enter the market um, there are issues also with how do you make this stuff uh, right now uh, electrolyzers to make green hydrogen are built in santa's tool shed like there is no mass manufacturing of electrolyzers anywhere that's an opportunity for america it's an opportunity for other countries as well, but you've got to know that before you get into it. Ultimately, if you want to make a lot of hydrogen, we're also going to be limited by the infrastructure. We're going to be limited by the infrastructure for transmission lines to deliver zero carbon electricity. We're going to be limited by CO2 pipeline capacity to make blue hydrogen. There are infrastructure limits. We can get going. There's good places in America to start today on blue hydrogen and green hydrogen for real that are economic and smart. But if this is going to be a national solution, we're going to need more infrastructure. Things like Build Back Better become an opportunity set to be considered. This gives you a sense of where blue and green hydrogen are made around the world. The blue facilities are at the top. Look at the numbers there in terms of the tons per day, hundreds to thousands of tons per day. Some of those are in the United States, such as Air Products, which is in Texas, or Coffeeville, which is in Kansas. You need fertilizer plant in Oklahoma. So we know how to do this, actually. To assert to, The United States is the king of low-carbon hydrogen, like we do this today. Quest is in Alberta and North America, uh, up in Canada. Uh, I'd pull the attention, though, to the only working uh, green hydrogen facilities in the world today. Trondheim in Norway and Fukushima is just 10 megawatts. The biggest operating system for green hydrogen in the world is 10 megawatts. That is a factor of 100 to 1,000 times less than a commercial system. So we got work to do. The good news is help is on the way. Projects like NEOM in Saudi Arabia or the uh, Asian Renewable Energy Hub in Australia are, making, are, are, are being built right now, and they will make hydrogen at these kinds of scales entirely with renewable energy. So it can be done. To go from a white sheet of paper to a facility like that is about 10 years and about $40 billion. We can do it. You just got to know what you're getting into. Let's talk a little bit about the sectors. Let's start with chemicals because that's the big one in the US. It's 3% of global emissions. It's a big fraction of US emissions. The heat alone is about half of that. We use it for all kinds of stuff. The best options for the chemical sector, hydrogen. We can start today with blue hydrogen because right now gray hydrogen is going in. We can retrofit those facilities today and capture the CO2 and make them blue. Good thing to do. Eventually, we will get enough green hydrogen online that we can start phasing out the fossil hydrogen and start phasing in the renewable hydrogen. That's inevitable. Whether we do it in 2030 or 2050 or 2100 is up to us. We can also start with stuff like biogas. Instead of running natural gas or, or fossil methane into these systems, we can start making biogas either from landfills or from wood chips, whatever we want to do, and we'll start feeding that into the system. That'll have a lower carbon footprint. We can do a little bit of partial electrification. In particular, a lot of chemical plants have steam that goes into them. And there are small electric furnaces and boilers that will make steam heat at the level at which you need. This would double the price of steam, but it's a place to start. And so there's places, as these facilities start to replace their steam units, we can think about getting low carbon electricity into those and think about making some low carbon steam to go into the chemical processes. There's certainly, of course, an opportunity to go after efficiency. 
that is a big opportunity in the chemical system. It is not so much in cement and steel. Those are already very efficient systems. In chemicals, there's better opportunities to get the efficiency into the system. And of course, we should invest in innovation as well to get novel processes into these systems in a 10 or 20 year timeline. When these assets get replaced, we'd love to be able to replace them with something that's born clean. We have to invent those things still. Iron and steel, big global problem, big US problem. A single big US iron steel plant will emit 15 million tons. It's a, like large single sources, big howitzer rounds that you can tap. And again, you need the high temperature heat to do it. The best option by a lot is just carbon capture on the whole system. And the reason why is because when you make steel, you have byproduct CO2. The chemical reduction of turning iron ore into iron emits CO2 and consumes coke. When it does that, it just gets emitted. And you can't just substitute for that stuff. We are getting close to being able to use bio coke at some point to do such things. But today, carbon capture on the whole system, that gets you 50% reduction at about 50 bucks a ton. It's a reasonable price for a reasonable outcome. Some places around the world are starting to run hydrogen into the existing blast furnaces, uh, up to 20%. Nippon Steel in Japan, uh, ThyssenKrupp Pilot in Germany, we're starting to get to being using hydrogen. So again, if you have the low carbon hydrogen molecules, you can start using them. There's some other options as well. Modified coking, uh, we can get out of the primary production business and increase recycling through electric arc furnaces. It's worth knowing that steel is already the most recycled substance on earth. 90% of US production is already recycled steel. So we can't do a lot more recycling, but it is something that in other jurisdictions would be more valuable. Uh, again, same thing, we need novel processes that don't exist yet to replace the existing assets. Hopefully we can get there. Companies like Boston Metals that are doing direct uh, uh, molten electrification are examples of the sort of thing which in 10 or 20 years we hope to be able to see in the marketplace. For now, hydrogen and carbon capture are the good things. For the cement industry, big fraction of US emissions, 21% of US emissions, a bunch of that is heat, and there are really no good options. I can't say this again, there's really no good options. Um, and this chart kind of shows this, 50% of the emissions are just the emissions from the byproduct chemistry, that's the gray bar. The only system that gets rid of that stuff is carbon capture, period plop. Otherwise, the maximum amount of reduction that you can get is like 40%. You just can't get any more with anything else. So CCS on the whole system. Also, cements use solid fuels that go into them. They, they throw stuff like tires and trash and municipal solid waste into them already. So thinking about improving the footprint of the biomass that goes into that thing is a thing you can do, okay? Um, so the better thing to think about with cement is what can you not do instead? So can you, not, can you use less cement by substituting cementaceous materials for clinker? Are there novel processes that, for example, will bind carbon dioxide into the cement? Um, are, are there other things that you can do in the system? This is an interesting arena that's going forward, but in the near term, the big lever is, you know, you just got to do the carbon capture on the plants. The good news is stuff is going forward on this. Be before I go to the next slide, though, I want to leave you a fact in your brain as a policymaker that I want you to understand. If you are a wholesale steel supplier and your price of steel goes up 5%, you're out of business you will lose 100% of market share on the global market. So what the things we're talking about here for increase of price for steel and cement, we're talking about like 100% increase in price for a lot of these options. If we did carbon capture on a cement plant, it would go from $100 a ton for concrete to $200 a ton for concrete. It would double the price. For steel, it would go from 350 bucks a ton to 400 bucks a ton. These are big levers. However, the flip side of that is the price of the finished good to barely changes at all. If you double the price of steel production, the price of a car goes up 2%. If you double the price of concrete, the price of a bridge goes up 1%. And the reason why is because 
most of the cost of a bridge is not the cost of the concrete. It's not the raw materials. It's the architecture, it's the land, it's the labor, it's all these other things. And so the price the consumer sees is small. So there's a way to think about policy that makes this invisible to the consumer and protects the wholesale producer from trade exposed damage. That is where the policy discussion is today. This is my last slide and I'm gonna take a little bit of time on it. The way that you can think about these things then is a balance of incentives. So for example, the government buys half the concrete in the country. Department of Transportation, Army Corps of Engineers, the, they buy 20% of the steel. So buy clean procurement is a huge policy option in this space. Government doesn't buy buildings the way that it buys concrete and cement. It buys a lot of concrete and cement and steel. It buys a lot of fuels that use hydrogen going into them. So there's a way to think about buy clean that is specific. There are not tax credits for any of the stuff I've talked about. So thinking about a production tax credit or an investment tax credit for say low carbon hydrogen or low carbon steel creates an opportunity and incentive to get investment into the markets and clean up the existing fleet. Because if you can get a tax break, people are excited. Of course, there's things like the Department of Energy grants, the 2020 uh, bill uh, that was the uh, omnibus uh, includes $6.5 billion of money and authorities for the Office of Fossil Energy to do demonstration and testing of the, a lot of this stuff. So there's, if the appropriations come, there's authorizations for it. Uh, there's ways to think about replacing existing assets. You can replace a blast furnace with something else that emits less. Awesome. We need to think about incentives that come together with that. Again, uh, in a, the $1.9 trillion relief bill, in a Build Back Better bill, there's ways to think about that. I've mentioned infrastructure in passing, the infrastructure costs are the hardest parts of this for an industrial company to handle. If you're a steel maker, you don't want to build transmission lines. You don't want to build CO2 pipelines. We should be building that common use infrastructure for everybody, and that will lower the price of entry for all of these clean solutions. A specific example of this actually is upgrading ports. A lot of ports are where the industrial facilities exist. They exist in ports like Houston or Los Angeles or Newark. So in fact, thinking about upgrading the infrastructure at ports, creating things like transmission lines, clean electricity options, carbon capture, storage sites, hydrogen pipelines, these are things that can actually serve a wide set of industrial facilities at these industrial ports. The last thing, of course, if you don't like carrots, you might like sticks. There's certainly ways to do this with regulations. You can think about stuff like an emission standard and just says, hey, if you're a cement plant, we're going to cap you at this emissions level per ton. Go figure it out. The problem is that that will really disadvantage U.S. industry. We will have offshoring and we will have leakage. So you need a policy measure if you're going to do that that matches. The one that is most commonly talked about is border tariffs, where you basically, it's a protectionist measure, where you say, we're going to disadvantage U.S. industry, and with it, we're going to disadvantage foreign industry at in the same time. That's a reasonable way to go. Might I offer an alternative? The alternative is something called an output-based rebate. And an output-based rebate is the opposite of that. You give support to US companies that exceed their regulatory threshold and pay them for performing better. It's, it creates a virtuous cycle. And instead of creating a tariff problem with another country, we are instead empowering US domestic production. And that makes us more competitive in a carbon-constrained world. Behind all of this, we certainly need innovation policy that is essential and underserved right now. And of course, with all of this, we need to think about the wage and equity and labor considerations as well. A lot of the people who work in industrial facilities are black and brown and disadvantaged communities. A lot of these assets exist in disadvantaged communities that deal with environmental justice issues. So we should have to think about these things all as one party. It's different than the electric sector. It's different than the transportation sector. It's its own thing. In fact, it's like 10 things because each sector is a little different. Pulp and paper is different from glass making, is different from ceramics. So you really need to get into it and think about it a little bit as you go forward. In that context, the last word, more analysis is good. In the studies that we've done at Columbia University, it is shockingly hard to just find data. The government doesn't even gather data on this. It doesn't do analysis on it. You could start at a pretty low level by asking for that. I'm a little bit over time. 
but not much. Thank you for your time and attention. This was fun. Well, I'm, I'm glad you thought it was fun because I thought it was fascinating. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, there was so much information, just as a reminder for folks who may have joined us a little late, everything's available online. You can see Julio's presentation and we'll do a written summary as well. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you spent so much time talking about the hydrogen piece of it. I think that's something that as we were putting this together, um, something that we haven't spent a whole lot of time on at ESI. Um, so I really appreciate um, that you spent so much time in your presentation talking about that. It's really, really interesting. My pleasure. And I look forward to the opportunity to give you a 10 hour lecture on the subject. <laughs> okay. What, why not? Right. Um, so maybe we'll save that one though to back when we're in person, we can have it like nicely catered, and, you know, that have like a nice. progressive dinner hydrogen lecture combination. Right. Although, although I'm also happy to start with like the 30 minute lecture, if that's a little okay. more convenient for people. Well, excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much, Julio. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, that brings us to the fifth of, no, wait. Yeah, the fifth, number five of the five sectors, fifth of five sectors that we're talking about today, sorry. Um, and uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, John Davis Bakari. He's a nationally recognized public and private sector infrastructure leader, delivering some of America's most challenging projects and driving the adoption of equitable community serving infrastructure policies and projects at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, John is president of Axelon Smart Mobility USA, delivering artificial intelligence-based transit and traffic solutions that reduce emissions and congestion and improve safety. John previously served as deputy secretary for the Department of Transportation for the Obama-Biden administration, leading the department's implementation of the $48 billion transportation component of ERA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Tiger Grants and Loan and Credit Programs. Uh, as a member of the President's Management Council, John was then part of the core team developing policies, procedures, and budgetary priorities for the executive branch. He's going to tell us all about transportation sector missions. And John, we're a little bit behind. Um, sorry about that. We're getting you started a little later than we, we had a technical glitch a little bit earlier. But please don't let that impact your presentation. Um, we would still love to hear all of it. I will absorb the, uh, the overrun in my concluding remarks. So I hope that doesn't crimp your style too much. I'll turn it over to you to take it away. Great, thanks, Dan. And uh, I will try to be succinct, uh, succinct here. Uh, it's been interesting with the succession of speakers, each saying that they're the largest part of the problem that their sector is. Um, it's refreshing from a transportation point of view because everyone agrees we are the biggest part of the problem. Uh, so um, at almost 30% of US emissions, 28.2%, uh, the bottom line is you cannot respond to the existential challenge of climate change without completely changing the way that the transportation system is conceived, designed, and operated. And that's really the premise behind Build Back Better. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, uh, in a little bit of uh, detail, but uh, the, the policy uh, structure behind the transportation component of Build Back Better really focuses the U.S. In a, in a fundamentally different direction. In the past, if you think about transportation, uh, uh, is it's a means to an end more than an end in itself. It's typically been used for economic development, sometimes for quality of life, sometimes not. Um, but but there are two fundamentally different lenses that transportation projects are viewed uh, through Build Back Better, equity and climate change. Um, and and I wanted to uh, walk through those a little bit uh, in turn, starting with equity. Um, if you think about what we've done in the past, uh, the past 60 or 70 years, uh, uh, post-war uh, in particular, the interstate system with the viaducts that we've built, uh, the elevated highways we've built through cities, redlining, segregating, um, and uh, um, crippling neighborhoods within cities, we've divided communities, um, we have built transit service uh, around particular needs as opposed to a system-wide approach. Um, an equity lens on transportation leads you to very different decision-making than you have today. And it's important as a, as a conceptual backdrop to this to think about how federalism applies to transportation. There's this common misconception uh, that it's a Washington-driven process, that uh, policy happens in Washington, it trickles down. Um, the reality since colonial times is that project decisions are made at the local level and innovation is at the local level and it bubbles up. Uh, and if, if you don't accept that premise of how 
transportation project selection is made, you're never going to change uh, uh, how it actually works. So when you think about uh, an equity lens, uh, it's in individual communities, uh, it's thinking about redressing some of the inequities of the past. Um, it's taking things like transit deserts and making a priority connecting people with opportunities. Uh, it's, it's taking issues like local hiring, uh, which was prohibited in transit projects. Um, and in the Obama administration on a pilot basis, uh, local hiring was used in transit projects in mainstreaming that. Uh, job training and skills training is part of those projects. So that you're getting a, a twofer essentially out of those projects. Um, and, and, and finally, on the equity side, a real uh, uh, as uh, MBE and uh, minority business and disadvantaged business programs, as opposed to um, the check the box process that frankly you see in a lot of places right now, which means equity ownership by minority and disadvantaged businesses. So that leads you at the local level to a very different set of project decisions looking through the equity lens. Likewise, uh, with climate change, uh, there is no way, as I mentioned, to tackle the problem uh, without completely rethinking our transportation system. And it starts in the short term with electrification. Uh, there are other long-term options, uh, uh, for example, of fuel cells, especially in uh, for locomotives and, and uh, other uses. But in the short term, electrification is where we're going. Um, and it's uh, fleets, public and private, it's charging facilities, um, it's tax policies, uh, not just tax credits for uh, electric vehicle acquisition, but things like accelerated depreciation for fleet charging facilities, which are actually the long pole in the tent uh, for uh, electrifying. Uh, it's, it's making sure that the uh, public sector fleets, uh, for example, and private sector fleets are thought of as distributed energy sources, not just uh, electric vehicles, uh, but uh, essentially their own microgrids that can augment uh, uh, the grid when necessary. Uh, in addition to electrification, uh, active transportation is a critical part of the transportation system. And that's, a, that's an all encompassing term uh, everything from sidewalks and trails to micro mobility, things like bikes, uh, electric bikes, scooters, uh, that actually are more than just first and mile, first and last mile transportation, uh, but um, provide, uh, in in a majority of cases, uh, uh, a, a viable alternative to the single occupancy vehicle. Uh, a climate change response in transportation also means resiliency, building a more resilient system. Uh, you can look at storm events, uh, and uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy is still uh, the high watermark, so to speak, of that in some ways. But um, more resilient transportation systems are essential uh, if, if we're uh, going to thrive in the future. Um, and it's not just surface transportation. So uh, briefly on the aviation side, uh, in the short term, the electrification, for example, of training aircraft is happening today. And 10 years from now, uh, that will be uh, the majority of the fleet. Uh, for regional airliners uh, uh, and uh, uh, mainline service over the longer term, um, hybrid and other um, uh, uh, power sources uh, will be viable as the energy density increases. Um, uh, but it, also in the short term, the electrification uh, of just the airside ground support, the tugs, the uh, all, uh, the buses, all the other uh, portions of the aviation system can be done, and we shouldn't leave that out uh, as as part of the larger package. Uh, finally, uh, maritime, um, which uh, uh, is really important because pound for pound, uh, the maritime sector uh, is uh, some of the biggest uh, polluters on earth, burning bunker fuel. Um, and burning that port side in historically uh, minority and disadvantaged neighborhoods. Think of a megawatt class power plant uh, burning essentially sludge, high sulfur um, fuel um, in, in communities that already have a disproportionate impact. So things like shore powering, uh, uh, running off electric power uh, while ported, uh, electric uh, power for all the handling equipment on the maritime section is really important as well. So the those two lenses, equity and climate change, are key for where uh, we're going forward here. So how do we prepare for it? Um, and uh, some of you may be involved as we speak 
uh, translating uh, some of the policy process um, uh, into legislation. Um, but think about the preparation uh, at the local and state level where, again, the project decisions are made. Um, the, the, the project mix is being decided right now. This kind of high-low mix on the low end, it may be stormwater management retrofits and um, augmented transit service at the high end. Uh, uh, it's the more transformative, longer projects that are typically physical infrastructure projects that take um, uh, uh, years to, uh, to actually deliver. Uh, that pipeline is being filled at the local and state level now. The kind of conversations that should be happening right now are, are about the low end of the mix. Uh, can technology, for example, make an immediate impact uh, on climate change uh, uh, with um, software and uh, other technologies that can be implemented right now? The goods movement part of it uh, needs to be intermodal. Uh, and again, those decisions are made at the local and state level. This is very unusual for the transportation system because they have to, everyone has to get out of their uh, comfort zone on this. It means working with the parks and recreation department. It means working with your local school districts on their uh, fleets. It means working with the water and wastewater agencies. These are things that are not typically done uh, in transportation but will be driven by the mayors, the county commissioners, and the governors uh, that can make those decisions. Uh, you should also uh, think about preparation in terms of the existing Buy America requirements uh, that uh, uh, overlay transportation uh, uh, funding at the federal level and the Buy American um, uh, proposal that President Biden uh, has rolled out, which goes much further in building an ecosystem of American manufacturing as part of it. So um, those process changes uh, at the local and state level uh, are a, a required adjunct to actually having a successful program. I, I wanted to also briefly mention some of the policy and process changes that really have to happen um, uh, and uh, this is at the local, state, and federal level combined. It's, it's a whole of government approach in the vertical sense of, of government. First of all, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, really requires a rethink uh, if equity and climate change are, are your uh, primary goals. The, the purpose and need statement uh, of a NEPA document typically talks about moving people faster from one place to another. It does not typically talk about um, reducing impacts on communities, restoring, um, uh, in a restorative sense, uh, uh, fixing some of the problems of the past. It typically does not talk about emissions reductions uh, in, in a localized sense. So uh, the purpose and need statement of NEPA is now a climate impact statement. And the transportation reality of that is that if whatever you write into the purpose and need, you can pay for with, with federal funding. Uh, and I say that having delivered uh, projects all over the country where if you build into the purpose and need restoration of a stream valley, restoration of, uh, of a portion of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, it can actually be an eligible project cost. It really requires a rethinking of what NEPA means and, and, uh, and how we do it. Uh, NEPA should also be an equity impact statement uh, in the sense that um, you are required by case law to look at uh, disparate impacts um, uh, of a proposed transportation project. Let's flip that around and in a positive sense, think about how that equity impact statement portion of NEPA could actually restore communities and, and be used for that. Again, it's eligible as a, as a project cost if you build it in the purpose and need statement. So we, we have been rigid uh, and, and really following kind of defensive medicine in the NEPA process and just trying to be litigation proof. We should be much more innovative um, in, in, in what we can do. Uh, the second uh, policy and process change uh, that is essential for um, uh, uh, responding to climate change in particular is rethinking the right of way. This is partly a philosophical change. It's partly regulatory and uh, partly statutory. Um, so if you think about the right of way model that we follow today for our roads and especially our highways, um, uh, it's an ownership model. Uh, a state DOT owns that right of way in their opinion. Uh, it can only be used for other highway uses. It's okay to add a lane. It's okay to add an interchange. 
Uh, but if you want to talk about solar uh, power uh, uh, in the interchanges, if you want to talk about using the right of way for HVDC transmission, high voltage DC transmission, which is going to be essential for our, our renewable energy program, if you talk about fiber in the right of way, uh, those are typically the typically the answer is no, um, and you have to get to yes. If you move from an ownership philosophy of right of way to a stewardship model. And stewardship model is the highest and best use, almost in a real estate sense. How can you best use that precious resource that's public right of way in the case of highways, that's private right of way in the class of in the case of class one railroads that are running right into the center of every major city in America with essentially a conduit for high voltage DC. Um, uh, and interestingly, if you uh, look on the renewables front, uh, in the regions where renewables are generated, uh, as opposed to the, the, the load the, the, where the consumption is needed, um, and you draw lines for high voltage DC, they tend to actually parallel and in some cases exactly duplicate our interstate system. Um, so the point is that's a resource uh, that, uh, that we really should be using uh, in, in a stewardship model of right away to um, uh, respond to climate change uh, with renewables transmission and renewables generation. So, uh, and you should look for some of these elements in the Build Back Better package. Don't be shocked um, uh, if, you, if you see them. I mentioned that there's a, some regulatory underbrush uh, and other parts that have to be cleaned out. Uh, there's a prohibition uh, on charging facilities on national highway system and interstates. This goes back to the founding of the interstate days when gas stations were afraid that people that they would put gas pumps at rest areas um, and they would be competition. Um, it's uh, it's 23 111A, um, but that has to be eliminated if you're going to have charging facilities uh, in re at rest areas, for example, for trucks, uh, megawatt class uh, charging facilities where drivers can sync their required rest time with a charging facility. Um, and uh, and ra range anxiety goes away um, when you have at least the security blanket of charging facilities along the way. So as, as we measure our progress here, uh, the, as you all know, the National Climate Assessment, uh, NCA5, started in January 2020. We're in the next cycle of National Climate Assessment. In the past, transportation has been a portion of that. Uh, but it's been a little bit of a laggard and frankly, not a lot of depth and, and not a lot of, not the, the level of analysis that we really should have. Um, the, if you look at what mayors are doing around the country on climate change in transportation, the, the next national climate assessment um, should really uh, uh, be more detailed and show some of the changes that we're making. And uh, we need to similarly have a kind of scorecard for equity, which which there is no national equivalent for of the of the national climate assessment. So, um, t t just to sum up briefly, think about those two policy lenses: uh, climate change and equity. They are going to be central to both the formula programs um, and the discretionary programs. Uh, think about how local choices actually drive how the system changes and how quickly it changes, not federal policy, but federal policy encouraging local choices uh, that are different. And then think about um, uh, both the NEPA process uh, and higher and better use of our right of way, which is actually a pretty precious resource for our climate change goals. So that's, uh, Dan, that's a, a brief walk around of what you're likely to see. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, John, that was an excellent presentation. I do have a question for you, and, and maybe this is, and I'm sort of wary of time, and, and I don't want to keep people, you know, past four o'clock. But you know, transportation in some ways is maybe the most of the dem maybe the most democratic of the sectors we've talked about today. Um, we all interact with transportation many times a day in different modes, depending on where we live. It also seems to me to be one where there's a lot of near-term excitement and a lot of things that are changing. The, the fleets that are out on the road are changing. We're seeing, you know, we're, we're in traffic, for instance, and we see that delivery trucks are advertising the fact that they're, you know, not gasoline fire fueled anymore. And we're noticing Teslas and other brands of electric vehicles. We got a question that I think is kind of interesting. And it's about what the fact that 
transportation is relatively democratized and there are so many individual owners and actors that are involved in transportation. What does that mean for the ability to reduce emissions compared to something like the industrial sector where there are many fewer owners, there are many fewer operators of these big facilities, but in transportation, there's millions and millions and millions of, of sort of nodes in the system. What does that mean for sort of maybe where behavior comes into play and what does that mean for our ability to actually, you know, achieve the emissions reductions sort of on like a, you know, on a household scale or business scale? It's a great uh, question because in transportation, it is literally millions of individual decisions that are made. Um, and uh, by and large, those are rational decisions uh, uh, based on um, how quickly they want to get to where people get want to get to their, where they're going, um, what it costs them to do that. And, and uh, part of how you change that are the incentives and disincentives. Um, there's no pricing uh, by and large for surface transportation if you're driving yourself. Um, the, the costs of your vehicle, your insurance, uh, everything else are not apparent. They're not uh, unfolding before you on the dashboard um, le uh, like they are in other parts of the system. Uh, we have to price the system to reflect the actual cost of it or something approaching the cost of it. That, thing's, that means things like congestion pricing. Um, should you really be able to drive into the center of Manhattan anytime you want to without paying any price at all? Uh, if you believe that, then you understand why we have what we have in, in, in Manhattan today. The, um, so, so pricing is part of it. Um, the, the other part is we have to get to public transportation as a more viable alternative in most of the country. Um, it, it is in some of our core cities. Um, it is not in other parts of the country. And, and that requires the virtuous cycle of uh, better service, uh, more predictable service, um, uh, pricing that um, uh, reflects the kind of discount for uh, continued use and the like. We've never really worked on that. Um, I will tell you as a, uh, as a former state DOT secretary in Maryland, looking at capacity between, say, Baltimore and New York, um, I could add air capacity at BWI Marshall Airport, uh, and it was 90% federal money. Uh, I could add highway capacity, and it was 80% federal money. If, if I wanted better high-speed rail service, Amtrak service or commuter rail service, by formula, it's 0% federal money. So if you wonder why we have the system we have today, follow the money. Well, thank you for that. And uh, once again, great presentation. Um, I switched up my audio again. Hopefully it's a little bit better. I have a nice microphone. It's just not working today. So sorry about that. You, however, John, sounded great. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us today to help us understand transportation sector emissions. Um, and we also just couldn't have done today, not only without John's participation, but also without Christina's and Deepak's and Liz's and Julio's uh, presentations. Um, a really um, sort of excellent rundown over the last two hours of what emissions look like um, across these five different sectors. Um, we're gonna wrap things up. Um, as a reminder, we're getting, we have lots of questions and we didn't get to all of them uh, today, but we'll do our best to follow up with our individual question askers. Um, there were a couple common questions though that I can address here, and that is the most popular one is yes, what you just heard uh, and in some cases saw will be posted online. You can visit us www.eesi.org to watch the entire our, um, webinar that we did today, but you can also watch the individual segments. They're going to be broken out. And then you'll also be able to download slides and read written summaries that we'll provide as well in the coming days. So all of this will be available. We'll also be releasing, um, I think on Tuesday, um, a condensed version, of some of the highlights of from the five presentations is as the latest episode of our new podcast, The Climate Conversation. So um, when you're online and you're signing up for Climate Change Solutions, the newsletter, be sure to um, sign up to start, or subscribe, I should say, to, uh, to our podcast. Um, while I do a couple thank yous, I just want to call attention to what's on the screen right now. Um, we always do our best to improve and we read every bit of feedback that you send us. If you have a few moments to take our survey today uh, to help us understand what you thought of the second installment of Congressional Climate Camp and our um, offerings in general, 
I already know that the audio on my pen wasn't the best today, but you can still say that if you'd like in the survey. Um, but in terms of content, um, you know, please let us know and, and we'll do our best to incorporate that feedback into our future offerings. While you're doing that, um, let me just say thank you again to Christina, Deepak, Liz, Julio, and John for their wonderful presentations. Um, let me also uh, thank everyone at EESI who was able to, or who um, played a part in putting on today's Congressional Climate Camp. Uh, Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Taroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, as well as our five fabulous interns, Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel. Um, they all had a, a big part in, in pulling this off. I'm, in, in many ways, I have the smallest role uh, in providing it. So thanks to them and everyone at ESI for making this possible. Um, we will go ahead and end it there. Apologies for running a couple minutes late, but I think it was well worth it. Um, we learned an awful lot, uh, not just about sort of the importance of thinking big um, and thinking about climate change as an economy-wide um, challenge that needs to be addressed, um, but also understanding the, the differences between the different sectors um, and thinking um, about sort of how we recognize the differences in those um, sectors, but also use that information to come up with policy responses that make sense uh, and that feed up to the whole, to the big picture, so that when we're dealing with things economy-wide, we can do so in a maximum uh, or an optimal way. We'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you for joining us for Congressional Climate Camp number two. There are still two more sessions. The one in March will be all about um, past policy initiatives as well as current attitudes about climate change. The one in April will be all about win-wins. So things that we can do in the near term to provide mitigation and adaptation benefits. There is a briefing next Friday about energy efficiency that I'm very, very excited about. Uh, there's one after that we're doing with our friends at the Business Council uh, for Sustainable Energy about their just released 2020 fact book. So we have lots of stuff coming up. I think we have a briefing every week for like the next six or seven weeks. So a ton of programming coming up. Uh, and uh, of course, it's all available if you visit us online, www.esi.org. And never forget, you have to sign up for Climate Change Solutions if you haven't already. It's the greatest way to stay up to date. I hope everyone has a happy rest of your Friday and a happy weekend. And uh, we will go ahead and end it there. And until next time, um, we'll see you. Well, that was awkward. Until next time, be well and stay safe. Thanks so much.